all stand together as we get ready to worship here. Um, a word God gave me just a couple weeks ago, and it just really stood out to me, was that we're in a turbulent transition into the new season right now. We are transitioning into something new. Absolutely, we have been. But it's turbulent. <laughs> it's not easy getting there. Is anything good easy? <laughs> no. <laughs> Is anything new easy? No. But we're going to get there. Yes. And um, a scripture that's very, you know, we most of us will know it. But it's in Matthew. Matthew 14, 22 to 33. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's when Jesus walks on the water. And it's when he calls Peter out of the boat. And um, I'm just going to start somewhere here. Because some of, some of it I just really want to focus on. It says, shortly, um, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. So this is when they were on the boat. And they saw Jesus coming, walking on the lake. Um, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked out onto the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. So this is a picture of a storm, obviously, and... Um, Peter, he had that faith to step out. He knew he was, I, I really believe right now God is launching his people out into new things. There's something that he has purposed for you to do. He has a call on your life. If you are saved, if he has saved you, he has called you. He has given you a purpose. He's given you a promise. And when the waves come, when the storms come, the only way to get through it is to stay above that storm. Oh, yeah. And it's with our eyes focused on Jesus. He is the one who saves. He is the one who will say to you, why did you doubt? <laughs> Don't you know I am with you? Why are you doubting? <laughs> Don't you know that I have this figured out? That I am bringing peace to the situation right now? that I know what is on the other side of this. That's what Jesus is saying to you right now. So don't doubt. Don't doubt for a second what he has given you to do. Amen? Amen. Thank you. 
this morning but it says through every battle through every heartache through every circumstance I believe you are my fortress you are my portion you are my hiding place I believe you are it talks about Jesus being the way the truth and the life this morning amen so through whatever whatever circumstance comes we know we know and we we can believe that he is the way amen
God has been speaking to me over the last several days that he's, he's squeezing, he's squeezing me, and he's crushing me. And that's the very reason why, that's the whole process of being, of being used in God's hands for whatever he wants to do through you, in you and through you. And as Cindy said, right at the very beginning, new things, new visions, new ministries, new callings, new giftings, new open doors do not come easy. They don't. They just don't. But they do. They do come, glory to God. But there is a process called crushing. And it's not comfortable. It's not, it's not nice. It's painful. But it produces, the Bible says, that peaceable fruit of righteousness in our life that can only come through the trials that God takes us through, church. Doesn't leave us in, takes us through, praise the Lord. Yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because God is with me. He's bringing me through, hallelujah. And on the other side of the horizon, Cindy, as you said, on the other side of the horizon, church, that is what we have sensing in our spirit, we maybe can't put it into words, but we can. We, we know what God is doing. We know what God is preparing us for, and it's going to happen. Hallelujah! It is happening. We've been crushed over the last while. We've been crushed, and here we stand. Hallelujah! God hasn't done away with us. He hasn't beaten us up and left us to die. We are here stronger than ever, church. We're stronger than ever. Not in our own strength, but in His, because of the crushing. He, he is purging us, he's purifying us, and he's making us his vessel, as we as we sang. He's making us his vessel, glory to God. It's so good to be here today. You know, uh, when Matthew was, oh, thank you, Jay, for staying, staying on, okay? When Matthew was um, just a little boy, I don't even know how old he would have been, but uh, maybe maybe five or six. And, uh, you know, he would go to Sunday school. We, we would be in the church service, and then he would be in Sunday school. And then on the way home, you know, mom would always say, so, Matthew, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And we knew what his answer was going to be. It was the same thing every single time. Jesus. Jesus. That was it. What did you learn in Sunday school today? Jesus. So... Go ahead, Jay. This is what we're looking at here today. God. <laughs> God, part two. So if somebody asks you, what did Pastor Mike preach on today? God. <laughs> and then and then uh, they'll say to you, well, tell Pastor Mike that he needs to maybe go to Bible college, you know, and get a refreshing. God. So that's what we're looking at here today. I'm excited about it because uh, as, I, as I mentioned last Sunday, this is not a refresher course. It's not... Um, some kind of a basic training. It's not some kind of a God 101, right? We're, we're past that, church. We're past that. God is taking us on to bigger, better, greater, and deeper things, hallelujah, in who he is to us and in us, praise the Lord. So that's what we're going to be looking at here today. I wanted to share just a few uh, kind of funny prayers that little innocent children pray to, uh, to God. And these are real kids, and these are real prayers, innocent prayers, from Joyce. Dear God, thank you for my baby brother, but what I asked for was a puppy. You can look it up. <laughs> Here's one from Dennis. Dear God, my grandpa says, you were around when he was a little boy. How far back do you go? <laughs> thought about Chip when I, uh, <laughs> when I read that one. <laughs> Marcia, dear God. My brother told me how babies are born, but it doesn't sound right to me. What do you say? <laughs> and then Charlene, dear God, how did you know you were God? Who told you? Now, that's powerful, isn't it? Wow. Good question. Who told you you were God? <laughs> Have you ever wondered what kids think about God? It's kind of funny, some of the things, because some of them are very humorous, obviously, from our standpoint as adults. And then some of them are very serious. Remy. Uh, thinks this about God. God lives inside every person. So my doctor has seen God when he cuts people open. <laughs> Eve. 
and he thinks God is, I wish God had a phone so that I could talk to him, because I don't know if he hears me when I'm praying. <laughs> Rebecca, God walks me to school every day so that I will be protected. That's beautiful. Yeah. And then Ian said this, God is up as high as the sun. He sometimes might get hot. So, <laughs> I can understand that from a child's perspective. You know? and John said, prayer is a blessing. It's a way to thank God or to say you're sorry. That's awesome. Love it. Kalen said this, God must have big hands because the song says he's got the whole world in his hands. <laughs> Lauren said this, God is very loving. I imagine he's very tall. I love him. I love that. That's awesome. And then the last one is Ashley, and this is a really serious one as well. It's beautiful. She says, when I hear about God, I want to know more. Although I can't see him, I feel him. He is perfect and pure. I know that he has felt pain and that he has suffered greatly to take away my sins. Wow. Out of the mouth of babes in the church. That's, that's amazing, eh? Some of, those, some of those perceptions. And I think there are even more than perceptions because God's heart is for little children. And I believe they have a greater understanding of who he is in such a simple, natural way than what sometimes we complicated people have an understanding of God. So that's why, you know, we need to be as little children to come into the kingdom of God. And so last Sunday, as, as you perhaps remember, I spoke on the subject of faith. And faith is one of those subjects that you can never, you know, go through entirely, totally, all of your life. There's always new things about faith. There's always, there's always new things to learn. There's always new things to understand about faith and how we are to live by faith, as the Bible says. The just, that's you and I, we are just in the Lord. We shall live by faith. Amen. So I spoke about faith last uh, Sunday in regards to God, because as you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, that without faith, we cannot please God. It's impossible to please God. And I just kind of felt like the Lord wanted me to just take a little bit more time on the whole subject of faith, because faith in itself is nothing, 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 nothing. You can claim that you've got this great faith, big deal, <laughs> you know, big deal, but faith Church requires something that is called action. Action. Because the Bible says that faith without works, that's action, is dead. It doesn't impress God whatsoever. And, and I think it was James, he says, show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. And so faith is always accompanied and, and evidenced by works. And so that's, that's what faith is all about. Now, when we pray, Lord, have your will in my life, right? And we do. We pray that. That's a good prayer. Lord, have your will in my life. But sometimes, church, that can end up actually being a passive excuse for doing nothing. Did you hear what I said? That can be a very empty, you know, passive, lazy excuse for doing nothing. God, let your will be done in my life. And meanwhile, God's saying, well, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Get with the program. You know, because we can get into that mode in life where everything is just, well, if it's God's will, right? If it's God's will, what an excuse that can become. But then on the other hand, church, there's also another warning and a danger that we have to be aware of. And that is something that is called presumptuous faith. Presumptuous faith. I don't know if you're familiar with the word presumptuous, but it's in the Bible, actually, eight different times. Presumption simply means it means stepping up, uh, stepping out intentionally. So it's not like you're just thinking about something or praying about something, but you're literally intentionally stepping out into something that God does not approve of, that God's blessing is not upon. And so you're just going to go ahead and do it anyways because this is something that you want to do, you know. And, and so you're, you're you're doing it, you're planning it. Now you're actually doing it. And you're saying, God bless this. God bless this. Meanwhile, you don't have God's favor on it. You don't have God's blessing upon it. You don't have God's permission or approval upon it. And by the way, speaking about permission, I want you to understand here something today as well, because there's a difference. Don't get the two of those uh, things mixed up. God's permissive will and God's perfect will, all right? Because sometimes God, just like we do as parents with our children, they keep on going on and on. I want this. I want this. I want to go there. I want to do this. And, you know, we've kept saying, no, no, we don't want you to do that. That's not good. And then finally, you give in. 
not because you're approving of it, but because you're permitting it, because you know that there's a lesson that has to be learned in this. That's how God works with us. Don't get the two mixed up. When God gives you permission about something because you just don't seem to want to really catch on to his perfect will for your life. And so God will per permit you to do something, to step out into something and show you that you're going to fail because you're doing it on your own. But this is what you want. And you're going to be stubborn about it. And you're just going to go ahead and do it with God or without God. And, and there's a danger in that because the more you have that kind of an attitude and the more you literally put that into effect and place in your life, your heart becomes hardened to the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. And you, you become hardened. Your ears become dull to hearing the, the voice of God. And now what happens is you become deceived in thinking that actually what you're doing, hey, God is blessing it. This is what God wants me to do. And yet you are totally 180 degrees away from what God wants you to do. So that's, that's what I'm saying here today, church. We need to hear what God is saying. And then we need to step out in faith with works and we will see the goodness and the glory of God coming to pass in our lives, in our homes, our families, our workplace, our ministries, and on and on and on and on. God wants to bless you in all of those facets and areas of your life. He's not holding anything back from you. The only thing he's doing is he's saying, he's saying I need you to step out in faith, but it has to be my will. It's got to be my will. And by the way, God says... <laughs> Stop telling me, well, it is your will. Stop telling me that. I'm telling you, this is my will. And so stop hardening your heart. Stop closing your ear and do what I've called you to do because my blessing is on it. I'm not just giving you my permission. I am giving you my approval. I want God's approval. I don't want his permission. You know, because there's a way that seems right unto a man. You know, God may permit it, but it, it's a way that seems right, but it leads to destruction. And so, you know, we have to be very aware that we are living in a time now where we don't, we can't afford to, to miss the will of God, church. We can't afford to argue with God. We can't afford to be double-minded back and forth with God. We've got to hear from the Lord. And how does that come? It comes by waiting and then by stepping out in faith. Not presumptuous faith. Not presumptuous faith, but faith that is, faith that is, understood because you're walking in the spirit because you're spending time in the word of god because your ear is open to hearing what the spirit is saying to you personally and when when you know what god wants you to be doing you will know it's not a matter of, well i'm not sure no you will know there's going to be a an explosion in your spirit there's going to be an excitement there's going to be a peace it doesn't mean it's going to be easy it doesn't mean it's going to be without any kind of trial because everything we do to get started always is going to have that kind of a kickback to it but nevertheless, you know, you can't rely on enthusiasm either. There is an excitement and a joy that comes with when God speaks and he says, this is what I want you to do. And you've got that perfect clarity and understanding. No confusion, no misunderstanding, right? You can't say, God, I misunderstood. Sorry, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> you got to hear the voice of the Lord and then simply do it, church. The time comes when you just simply have to do it and you trust God. And you have to take that step. It's like falling over a cliff, but knowing that God's hand is right there to hold you, glory to God, and to take you across that valley, across that chasm, onto the other side of blessing, favor, peace, joy, and fullness, and destiny that God has for your life. Hallelujah. And so that's the difference between God's permission and between God's perfect will for your life. So we need to be aware of that. In other words, we have to be careful because the Bible says that except the Lord build the house, why? We labor in vain that build it. So we can build it, but if God's not in it, we're going to build it in vain, and it will eventually come down. And so, in other words, we're talking about, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, I'm going to, I'm going to want this, I'm going to want that. All of these things that we just want, that we just desire, that we just... You know, we go by our feelings so many times, our feelings that can so easily deceive us. I want you to see on the screen on James chapter 4, because he deals with that very thing. You know, I'm just going to do this, and I hope it will work out, and I hope God's with me. No, look what it, James warns us about that. He says, come now, you who say, okay, today or tomorrow, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go into this or that town. We're going to spend a year there. We're going to do business and make a profit. 
Well, isn't that a wonderful plan? It's not if God's not in it. <laughs> it's a terrible plan <laughs> if God's not in it. And I know God gives us freedom, but He also He also gives us a, a desire and awareness to wait upon the Lord, to hear from God, because you might be doing something that looks right and seems right, and everybody around you, come on, your friends and family, they're all cheering you on. Yeah, 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 this is good. And so you got, you're all pumped up because everybody's around you, but they're not always going to be around you. Because when you move to that other town, or when you pick up that other ministry, or, or you, you change whatever it happens to be, you change your jobs, whatever it happens to be, do you think those people are going to be there when all of a sudden you're, you're, you're down on the dumps all by yourself? What have I done? And this is what James is warning us about. It can sound like a great plan. There's nothing wrong with making plans, but we have to understand that God has to be in that plan. And so they make these plans. We're going to go here and there for a, this amount of time. We're going to do this. We're going to make all this money. Verse 15, James says, you ought to say this instead. If the Lord is willing, if the Lord is willing, church, if the Lord is willing, then we will do this and then we will do that. If the Lord is willing. Okay? It's very important. And so we have to be aware of presumption. I want you to see, no, sorry, it's not on the screen, but just listen to this. It's in Psalm 19, verse 13. This is one of the eight places in the Bible that uses the word presumption. And David writes this, and he says this, Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins, then I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. And then I will be free from the great transition. Oh, sorry, great transgression. So what is the great transgression? What is the worst thing we could possibly do in serving the Lord? The worst possible thing we could do is to, hear me, hear me now, is to know what God is saying and requiring and wanting of us, and we just simply resist it. Say no. Or we say not now. Or we say no, no, I, I've got too, many, too much on the go right now. You know, we come up with all these reasons. No, that church is the great transgression that David is writing about. And the reason that he calls it a great transgression is because it goes totally against God's will. And David calls it a presumptuous sin. And it is a sin. You can see it all throughout the Bible. Men and women of God who were called by God, who had a, who had a destiny by God, who had an, an assignment from God. They had an assignment from God, and they and they came to that place where they turned away from God's will, and they entered into a presumptuous sin of, of saying no, no. And you can see that all throughout the Bible, of, of men and women who, who, fell, who fell tragically and terribly when God wanted to bless them, God wanted to use them mightily, and they came to that place where they just simply said no. And the reason why that happens so many times so many times, is because, as I said a moment ago, we rely upon our feelings. If we were ever in a feeling-based society, generation, it is today. It is. It really is. Everything is all about feelings. Well, if I feel it, or if I don't feel it, oh, I feel this, oh, I, don't, I feel that. And everything is feelings. Everything's emotions. Now, here's the danger about emotions is simply this. God <laughs> created us with emotions, Right? We cry, we get angry, we get happy, we laugh, we, we, we get sorrow. We have all these emotions that go through us because God made us that way to have emotions. He didn't make us like robots without emotions, right? We just we just do what he says, you know, we just you know his command is, is all that we all that we do. No, we have emotions. We get stirred up in our emotions, but the danger of that, and Jesus himself got emotional at times as well. The danger of that, church, is when you start looking to your emotions, you start relying on your emotions to dictate what you're going to do instead of what God's will is that is found through prayer, through his word, through waiting upon him, through confirmation. You know, God can confirm very clearly what he's asking you to do or what he's, he's wanting you to do. He can confirm those things, and he often does. I'm thankful when God confirms that because... It's a natural thing when emotions start to rise up that you start counting the cost. Well, Lord, if I do this, you start thinking, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be all this fallout. There's going to be all these consequences. People are not going to be happy about this. People will be upset about this. You know, my family, my friends, people in the church. 
And you can go on and on with that, all these emotions, you know, because you don't want to hurt anybody. You don't want to have any regrets. Emotions are there. But if we start relying on the emotions instead of knowing, thus saith the Lord, what God has spoken, what God has said, and if he needs to, God will bring a confirmation. He certainly will. And when he does that, all it's intended to do is to pump you up and say, thank you, God. Now I know, now I know, God. I already did know, but now I do know. <laughs> and I'm going to go forward, and I'm going to accomplish. I'm going to do what you're calling me to do. And it's called, church, faith, hallelujah, with works. Not presumptuous faith. Not presumptuous sins, the great transgression of knowing but not doing. That's the danger that so many Christians are in today. How many, how many Christians today ought to be in so many different places of, of ministry of God's choosing and different places of where, where he wants them to be in the marketplace or wherever it happens to be. And, and yet they're not there because they're doing it their way and not God's way. God can't use you when you're doing it your way. And so you presume that God is okay with everything. Why? Well, because it feels right, Pastor Mike. It just feels right. I know it, it seems, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't, you know, even in the Word of God, it doesn't sound right. But it feels right, Pastor Mike. Well, let me give you a lesson from the life of Samson. All right? <laughs> if, you know the, if you know the story of Samson, which I'm sure we all do, we probably learned it when we were kids. And Samson came to that place. He knew what God's will was. He was to be the deliverer, the judge of Israel. And he ended up in the arms of a beautiful woman, seductress, by the name of Delilah. And after a lot of nagging and after a lot of, you know, crying, finally Samson gave in and he gave her the reason for his strength. He exposed to her, he revealed to her the secret of his strength. And it was that he was to never cut his hair. And so while he's laying in Delilah's lap, you know, so nicely sleeping, everything's cool, everything's wonderful. He's got this new girlfriend. He's the mighty champion. He's undefeated. And that very moment, she cuts, she, she calls somebody in and they cut his hair. Now here's the, here's the lesson about this, by the way, because this is really, really what I'm talking about here today. Delilah yells, and she wakes him up, Samson, get up, get up, the Philistines are upon you. And this has happened before, not once, but several times. And he would get up, and he would shake himself, and the power of God would come upon him, and he would destroy those Philistines, and he would pick up great big, huge gates and carry them up to the hill of the city, and on and on. He did all these supernatural feats of strength, because he knew the will of God, he was in the will of God, but he came to a very tragic end, because when she said, Samson get up and he didn't realize his hair was gone and he got up and the Bible says just like every other time he began to shake himself because he knew that's how he brought the power of God on him and they ended up capturing him and putting out his eyes and making a laughing stock out of him and he didn't know the Bible says he didn't know he didn't know church that the spirit of the Lord was not with him oh he shook himself just like everything else and what a danger that is. You know, we get into these traps of routine and ritual. You know, where, where, well, if we just do this, you know, if we just sing this, if we just pray this, if we just go there and do this and do that, presumption, presumption, presumption. We don't even know that our hair, our strength, our power, our witness is gone. Our leadership is gone. Our authority is gone. And so we scream a little bit louder. We yell a little bit louder. We jump a little bit higher. And it's all in vain. It's gone. Samson's power was gone. And you know the rest of the story. We won't get into that. God restored his power because he repented. And so presumptuous faith is motivated by emotions. Presumptuous faith has a tendency to just jump right in without waiting upon God. And you and I have the power and the ability to force the door open. We can force it open. We can God says, go ahead. I've shut that door, but go ahead. If you want it open, go ahead. <clears throat> Force it open. You'll get it open. But Jesus is the one that opens doors, hallelujah, that no man can shut. And last Thursday, I was right here praying in the church. And the Lord spoke to me as I was praying. And he said, it is time for my people 
and I wrote it down because I want to get it right. He said, it's time for my church, listen to this church, to bring into order the things that are emotionally driven and not faith driven. Did you get that? God's saying it's time to bring into order. He's calling us, his people, to bring into order the things that are emotionally driven and not faith driven. Because that's 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 where we're at today in 2022. We're relying upon what feels good, what seems right, what looks nice, what we want. Doesn't matter what God wants, but it's what we want, and it's our emotions. It's all about me. Oh Lord, it's all about me. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Don't you remember Jesus saying, Hey, follow me, take up the cross, right? Follow me. Die to yourself. It's not about you, it's about him, hallelujah. And so I say all that to say it's not wrong to have a plan as long as you have God's approval. David said this in Psalm 37, 5 on the screen. He said, look at, here's how you know the difference between God's approval and God's permission. David says, commit your way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Bring what to pass? Your plan? No. No. His way. Right? Commit, commit your way unto the Lord, trust in him, and he will bring his way to pass in your life. And so you cannot neglect that middle part of that verse, trust also in him. So we commit our plan to God. We, we feel like we have a plan. We feel like we have a vision. We have a, a, an order from God. And the Lord says, commit that to me, but then make sure you trust in me as you're giving it to me. And guess what? I'm going to bring it to pass. Hallelujah. God's going to be faithful to no matter how hard, impossible, how difficult, how unusual, how no way, it's not going to happen. God says, I'm going to bring it to pass, church. Have you ever experienced that before? I'm sure you have. I have as well. Well, get ready, get your seatbelts on because you're going to experience it in a higher level uh, that you've ever known before. And it's going to come forth by faith. Hallelujah. By faith. So God is not obligated to bless your own plans. Can anybody say amen? amen. <laughs> He's not obligated to bless your own plans. Plans that have not been committed to him, as we just read. Several years ago, and uh, Michael and Matthew, our sons, were, were, were little, somewhat little. And Julie and I, we were in Waterloo, and we were taking care of nine apartment buildings. By ourselves, nine apartment buildings in Waterloo. It, it was a it was a blessing. It was a blessing. We were getting a good paycheck from it. It was uh, the people were, were were well. You know they were good to work with, and and our our management were excellent. They were there for us. They were on our side to help us in any way. So it was a real blessing, and it was something that was really needed at that time as well because it just came. We know that God opened up the door for us because he wanted to bless us with this job opportunity. Nine buildings, it sounds like a lot, and it was. But as I said, the bonuses were amazing. Isn't that right, sweetheart? Yeah, yeah they were. She could go shopping. <laughs> there goes the bonus. Don't worry, it'll be there again next spring. But anyways, uh, anyways I remember one night through the wintertime, Oh, it was cold, and, and we just had a big snowfall, and Julie and I were out there at midnight with our shovels, shoveling off the sidewalks, and we were both tired and weary and exhausted, and I was looking up to the sky and said, Lord, why? What are you doing? You know, like, what are you doing? We don't have the strength to do this. And then the thought of nine buildings just kept on, you know, making us realize, what are we doing? And so... If you want God's will, you can get it, right? You can get it. And so we go to our pastor at the time. He says, Pastor, this is what's going on. Would you please pray for us that God will open up a new door for us because we can't do this anymore? I said, sure. So he prays for us. And uh, and then the next thing you know, well, actually, we had had another offer from a, from a, from a different uh, townhouse complex in Waterloo. And they were looking for superintendents, and so we had put our application in, and 
they they called us and they said that they would uh, like to meet with us. And so, to make a long story short, the pastor prayed for us. There's our answer. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. No more nine buildings. We can get out of here. <laughs> Anyways, Alice and Carl at that time, they helped us move into our brand new home. Oh, it was so beautiful. And this lovely townhouse complex. Little did we know that it was a student uh, complex. And it was a nightmare. It was a total nightmare. And then the managers would come, and they would come right into our home. They wouldn't knock or ring a bell. They would just take the key and come right into our home. And they'd go into the office and do their, their work from out of town. And it was a nightmare. Oh, my. I, I can't even take the time to explain to you what we experienced in those three months. Three months. And it made us realize afterwards, man, we had it pretty good, didn't we, in the other place with the nine buildings. What could we just do? <laughs> I wanted to share that with you, church, because it's not always greener. What, how, what, I don't know how to say this. The, the, the grass is not always greener on the other side. God was not telling us, I want you other way. God was not telling us, I'm going to open up this new door for you. We just, we just made that work in our own minds because our pastor prayed for us. There you go. Now we've got God's blessing. Well, you know what? <laughs> Do you want me to finish the story? Okay. <laughs> I didn't know where that was. Okay, I want to finish the story about that townhouse. Because that's where the faith comes in, and that's where God comes in. And God was there all the time. And so we got into this townhouse, and like Mike said, it was a, it was a nightmare. One night we were having dinner, and I don't know if Matthew remembers this, but I was so stressed out, I literally threw a plate of spaghetti across the room. I took the car keys, and I took off. He didn't have a clue where I went. That's how bad it was. But anyways, to make a long story short, praise the Lord. Before this all happened, this townhouse, we were in this apartment building, the nine, the nine buildings, and it was a blessing. But you know what? We needed more room for the kids, so we're getting bigger. That's why we were looking for something different, and all we knew was superintendent work. So anyways, I had, a, I had called several uh, uh, property managements before we actually moved, while we were in the apartments, and so when this was all going on, and it was a, a matter of three months that we were in that townhouse, and I got a phone call, and it was a property management that I had called, and they said, we're wondering if you're interested in this townhouse complex, over by, it was over by the superstore. Okay, so we're in this nightmare. I'm ready to take anything. And they, they called us. Uh, they had kept our number. And praise the Lord, that was our way out of that townhouse. And we got, we took that job, and we were there for a couple of weeks. And it was a blessing. And then from there, you know, he kept leaving us. But he did make a way out of that, you know. And, and it all worked out in the end. So God is good. He is faithful, and we worked that part out. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you, dear, for all those extra details. I'm not, I'm not a detail guy, and she remembers all that. But the moral of the story is don't listen to your pastor. That's what the moral of the story is. <laughs> listen to God. Hear from God. It, it really helps. I want to just quickly also talk one, about one more thing uh, in this message, and that is the, the matter of time. Time. We talked about time last Sunday uh, as well, but I didn't have enough time to talk about time. <laughs> so I want to talk about time because, as you know, God is timeless. God is timeless. He dwells in eternity. Hallelujah. And so what you and I experience, because we live our lives, you know, by agendas and by schedules and by alarm clocks and on and on and on. That's how we live our lives. Meetings and appointments. God doesn't work like that. He just doesn't work like that because he is the beginning from the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. So everything that happens to us right here and now in God's time frame, so to speak, eternity, it has already happened. It's already been done. He's never surprised by what's coming next. He's never surprised. He's never upset about anything when it comes to things that he's not aware of because he, there is never a, a, a time when God is not aware of anything that is taking place in our world or in our lives. And so time is constant. It never changes. What changes, church, is our sense of time. Our sense of time. 
And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's say it's, you know, approaching Christmas time and there's seven days left to Christmas. And so this little boy, this little girl, you know, you know, they, they get ready for bed and they're so excited because Christmas is coming and the presents and the and all the fun and, and parties and family and they're just really excited and you know how the whole story goes, right? You know, seven days before and, and how many more how many more nights, mommy? How many more sleeps, mommy? Seven more sleeps and then six more sleeps. That's how they first imagine time as a little boy or a little girl. And then finally, you know, one more sleep, and that's how they, and, and they can't wait for that time to come. They can't wait for those seven sleeps to come to an end because they're, they're all pumped up. That's all they think about is Christmas. Now, here's another scenario to consider. Here's a prisoner who's on death row, and he's been given the death sentence seven days before the execution was to take place. That same seven days that that little child experienced couldn't wait for it to come. It's not coming fast enough. That prisoner is coming way too fast. Those same seven days. Exactly the same amount of time in each case, but such a different perspective in each case as well. That's what you and I wrestle with all the time. The Bible says that a thousand years is like one day with God. Well, we can't grasp that because we live according to uh, seconds and minutes and, and hours and days and weeks and months and years. That's how we live our life. We schedule our time. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe what's on my phone. I have a to-do list on my phone. I need a to-do list to keep track of my to-do lists. I do. <laughs> because it seems like the more I do on my to-do list, it just keeps getting longer. <laughs> And so that's how we operate. We operate by, by time as we know it, as what God has given to us, because he knows that we are not eternal in that sense. He is. We operate on a time basis of seasons and of days and nights. That's how we operate. God does not operate that way. And so it's our perspective of time, our sense of time, that makes things seem so slow or so fast, and that it's the very same amount of time. All right, so God operates by eternity. Time has no bearing on God. He has all the time in the universe. And church, I want to close this message by simply saying this. That's why God, hear me, that's why God has all the time in the universe for you individually. All the time in the universe. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're experiencing. He knows what you need. He knows what you're desiring. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows all of that. And it's not just a matter of God coming along and saying, come on, smarten up, you know. You know, shake yourself. Get out of that. That's all that God does. God gives time. He gives you time. All the time that you need, glory to God. You know, because we operate by time, we don't always have the amount of time that we would like to have for one another. Because we do operate on schedules. And we have to be responsible to some degree in those schedules. God is not like that. He doesn't have to be responsible. He's just there for anybody, for whatever reason, at any time. Hallelujah. That's who our God is. And church, he knows the crushing that we go through as well. We sang about crushing this morning and the reason for the crushing. I want to end this message with this. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 17, it's on the screen. For thus says the one, God, who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Now listen to this. God says, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is, of a, who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. That word contrite means this. It means brokenhearted. It means crushed. It means wounded. It means oppressed. God says, I dwell with those who are crushed in their spirit. I dwell, I spend time with those who are wounded in their heart, who are brokenhearted, who are weighed down, heavy with cares in this life. God says, I spend time with those very ones because I'm bringing them through, hallelujah. I am carrying them. I am healing them. I'm restoring them. I'm giving them my time because I dwell with them in eternity, hallelujah. That's who God is. And then David writes this in Psalm 34, verse 1 to 3. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. 
Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. A church, how do you magnify the Lord? How can you magnify the God who dwells in eternity? How can you magnify the God who Solomon said the very heaven of heavens cannot contain him? How do you magnify him? Well, you don't. It's through our perspective. It's who we make God, not who he is, but who we make God. Look at the picture up here. There's a magnifying glass over the pages of the Bible. And that magnifying glass is enlarging the words of my Bible so that it's easier to read. When you remove that magnifying glass, the words don't stay the same size as they are in the glass. <laughs> they don't. They, they, they don't change. This is what I'm saying. God does not change, hallelujah. It's the way that we see him. It's the way that we perceive him. It's the way that we magnify him in our own understanding, our minds, our desires, all of those things. We magnify the Lord in that very way, by the way we live our lives, by the way that we love one another, by the way that we love the Lord, by the way that we witness to others, by the way that we conduct ourselves in a manner that is pleasing and approving unto God. That is how we magnify the Lord, David said. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. You can't magnify God. It's who we are. It's our perspective of who God is. And I don't know about you. Yes, I think I do know about you, but I'm telling you for myself that I want to magnify the Lord. I want to see him in a greater way than ever before. Come on, church. New horizons. We're talking about new horizons. And all of a sudden, God is magnified. And Lord, oh my goodness, Lord. I, I, wow. I didn't know that about you. Wow. That's what God is doing, church. He's being magnified in our understanding. Stand with me, please. Stand with me for a moment. I want you to understand that today. There's a crushing. There's a crushing. There's a bruising. There's a wounding. There's a stripping. There's a squeezing that God is. It's not just a matter of God allowing it. It's a, it's a matter of God ordering it in your life. Because he wants to bring you to that place where he's magnified in your understanding. He's magnified in who we perceive him to be, who we come to know him to be, who we come to experience him to be in our life. There's so much more to God than we'll ever know. So much more to God than we'll ever know. We could preach God from here until the day we die and we'll never even begin to we won't even scratch the surface of who God is in our life. So I, I just want to say once or twice with you today how great and how mighty and how worthy God is of our love and our praise. And, and, and that to think that God would come and take all the time that we need. It would take sometimes we don't have the time for one another that we need, but God does. Spend as much time as, with him as you want. He's a very present help in trouble. Present help. He's a very present, right now, right here, help 